Alright guys, so this is the basic tracking lesson. I'm going to get you the more advanced one a little bit later. But um, I've created something that's going to track perfectly. It's not going to have any video artifacts, just so we can see how the tracker in uh, After Effects works. Nothing is ever this perfect. Alright, when you go out and shoot something, nothing will ever work this well. But this is, this is how we're going to learn this, right? So, um, there's two different compositions in the file I sent you. The first one has the footage I've created that has a tracker on it, right? And it's just a shape layer that I put a bit of animation onto so that, you know, there's something to track, right? This is just a perfect red circle on a black background. And it's that contrast that we're looking for. It's just five seconds of it. I then took that and I moved it I nested it into a, into a composition of its own. So that's the footage we're tracking. Because you have to track a layer, right? I can't um, set this up to track this sphere. Um, now, by the time we're done, you're going to wonder, like, you know, why would I track something this simple? You wouldn't. Um, <laughs> it's This is just to, to learn the tools. Ah, it's working this all right so first up we need to get a our tracker panel out here and it's not usually out by default so you go to window tracker and you have to select a layer and that's the layer that's going to track and there's a lot of different things we can do one of them is uh, stabilizing the motion and uh, track motion has a lot of different options underneath it so we're going to use that say track motion and you'll see it, it brings you into the layer right so you have to you can't see the whole composition while you're working with motion tracking you have to go into the layer that's being tracked all right now lots of different options here um, I'm gonna make this over here just so we can see it a little bit more easily so um, under track type that's the big one that you might change there's a few different ones. Transform means you can select just position, which is what we would do here, or you can add rotation and scale. Now you'll see when I add rotation there's two different points, right? In order to know something's rotating you have to see that one point is changing its orientation to the other point. So your laser swords, for example, you might track a point at the top and a point at the bottom so that the uh, effect you have going knows, knows to rotate. Um, scale is the same way. You need to have two tracking points in order to do that. I'm going to turn that off though and delete the second tracking point because I don't need it. Um, the other types include perspective corner pin which would mean um, four corners. You would track four different corners or something uh, which will be the more advanced uh, version of this lesson I have later. All right. Um, the other ones you probably won't find much uh, reason to use. I'm going to make sure I got rid of that second tracker. Yes, I did. There should be only one tracker, one track point. Um, I'm going to bring this back down, put this back in the corner, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit. This tracking point has about 17 different things to it and about 17 different places where you can put your cursor and something different happens. If you want to move the whole thing, which we do in order to get, to get it over to the red, you have to click inside the square, not on the square, not on a corner of the square, not on the hash mark, inside the square. And when you do that, it moves the whole thing. And there we go. So I need to, I need to get it over here in order for this to be any good. <laughs> You'll see actually when I'm moving it, how the whole inside turns a certain color. It's zooming in. So you don't necessarily have to zoom really far into your picture. You can, it'll kind of zoom in for you and you can see what it's tracking. All right. And the second thing we're going to do is we're going to make these boxes larger. And in order to do that, you have to click on the corners, right? The only way to scale these is to click on the corners. How big do we need them? Well, the inside box, that determines what is being tracked which means you can't do this because then it's just going to look for red and it might look for the red there or it could look for it up here or it could look for it down here. It, it can like float around in this area which is just going to make your track look awful. So 
Oops. I'm trying to... There we go. Yeah, I messed it up a little bit. Um, we need this, and you can see how the zooming in comes in handy now. Oh, too much to the side. Um, we need to be able to see the black outline around the sphere. That's what's going to get tracked. This contrast of red to black and red in this particular shape and this particular size um, of tracking marker, right? So that's what needs to get tracked. This outside box is where it's going to look for it. So I happen to know that it's moving that way. It's generally moving towards the right. So I'm going to expand this horizontally a little bit and move it this way. I may also need to expand it this way a little bit because um, this moves up and down. I, I gave it a sine wave, so it, it's going to move up and down. All right, there we go. And we need to be able to make this, the, the outside box should be big enough to catch the marker, but not so big that it's catching other things that look like the marker. That's obviously not a danger right now, but when you have markers on whatever it is you're tracking and there are other things in the video, um, you'd be surprised what the computer will think looks like a giant red dot or an, a yellow X or whatever it is that you are tracking. Um, it thinks about light and color differently than we do and it doesn't make the assumptions we do. So um, you want this box to be as small as plausible, basically. Um, and the last part of this is this hash mark. This right here is where the thing you are putting on this tracker is going to link to. So in this case, I'm going to just replace, I'm going to put an image in there, like a random in image. Its anchor point for that image is going to latch onto this. So if the anchor point is at the center of my image, then my image will be centered on this dot. Um, I could put, and I think I will, I can put this up here. Actually, I put it way up here. So that whatever it is I'm tracking will follow the red dot, but be over it. Think like if you wanted to put a halo over someone's head. Um, or if you're uh, maybe making something that looks like a fake video game and they've got like a sprite hanging around them, you can have a bit of bounce animation on the sprite, kind of going back and forth like this, oscillating. But it's tracked to something on your character, so that it's never quite getting too far away from your character and you don't have to worry about, like, you know, animating that part. Um, so I'm going to put that up there. Um, actually, you know what? That'll make it more confusing. We'll just put it here in the center for now. But the way, so that sets up what you're looking for, where you're looking for it, and where something's going to attach. All of these things have to be set up before you tell it to analyze and look for things. Because what it's going to do attach point, attach point, offset, confidence, feature center, all these things are going to be keyed on every single frame. So if you track this and then go, oh, I really like this to actually be up here. No. <laughs> no. It's it's here. And there's other ways to offset what you're attaching, um, but you won't want to reanalyze the whole thing. All right, so analyzing. Let me move this up a little bit so we can see it. So analyzing is when the computer actually does its thing and looks at each frame and tries to find this exact thing. And these are the buttons we used to do it. There's a play forward and a play backwards. There's also step forward and step backwards. You will end up using all four of these. Um, the reason for analyzing forwards and backwards is because sometimes the ideal frame to start from is like over here. Um, depending on what you've shot, you may get a really good look at your trackers here. You want to analyze forward, and then you can also analyze backwards. And because it's a good starting point, starting from the middle is fine. Um, the stepping forwards and backwards is if you ever have to go over an obstacle. You step forward, you move the tracker manually. You step forwards again, you move the tracker manually, and then eventually you get past the you know obstruction or the bad fuzzy frames or whatever, and then you get back to tracking with the computer. Um, the other thing we need to look at before we get started are the options on how it looks for the thing in the center. So I click on options. And I said before, computers think differently about 
light than we do. And they think differently about color than we do. You can track on one of three channels, although technically these really aren't channels. Um, RGB, meaning the color channels. So it can look um, at the difference between red, blue, and green. Um, so if you have red tracking markers on a green screen, that would be what you would track because they might both be pretty bright. Um, you know, this is a very bright red. If this was sitting on a bright green, they'd have the same luminance. Luminance would be if you have uh, white tape on a black background, right? There's no color information there, but there is a light difference. Now, there's also a light difference here, a very severe light difference. Um, so I could probably use either of these two for tracking. Saturation, I've literally never used. Um, I guess if you had things that were the same color but and the same lightness, but one was a very bright color and the other was grayish, I guess. But honestly, you should plan better than that and not have two things that are a similar color and trying to track one. Um, there is something here called Enhance Before Match. It used to have the option of saying whether it should sharpen it or blur it. They took that away. Um, so you can turn it on, see if it helps. I usually start with it off. Subpixel positioning, right? What that means is that it's not going to be positioning this tracker on a pixel. It's going to be in between them. And that's what you're going to need if you want it to be really refined and following properly. Um, adapt feature on every frame. If you have, you know, a circle or X or something and it's spinning in space, it's skewing, then technically speaking, the pixels you are looking at are changing on every frame. So you might have to turn this on. But there's a danger where that if you turn it on, it might like try to, it, it gets confused about which pixels it's looking at, like what feature it's looking at, and then it goes off on a tangent. The best place maybe to use it is on this bottom line right here. If confidence is below 80%, then it will start to adapt, right? So if, if something spins severely, um, Confidence means how sure it is that the thing it's looking at is the thing it's supposed to look for. And you can have it do different things. You can have it just continue and ignore everything. Um, I don't recommend that. You could have it stop tracking and you, human person, look at it and see how it's going and make a decision. You can have it extrapolate motion. So if something was going pretty fat, like if it's going in a particular direction, if the motion's very smooth, you can use extrapolate motion to kind of get over the, uh, you know, clunky parts and it should be able to follow. And then adapt feature would be more for something if it's not smooth motion, if it's more jittery and it's, um, you know, maybe, like I said, if the lighting changed, if the lighting changes in the thing you're shooting, um, it's going to not be able to find this. A lot of this is trial and error. Every piece of footage you have is going to work differently. I have it at stop tracking just because if it can't find this, then there's a bigger issue than <laughs> any of these other things is going to help me with. Um, also, if confidence is below 80%, that's relatively high confidence. Now, that should work here, but... All right. So next up, we press play. And you can see it's going through... Nothing's showing up here yet. None of the keys are going to show up here until it's stopped. Now, this is the ideal example. And you can see it's only one and a half seconds in. This is very time consuming. It's very resource consuming. This takes the computer a lot of work to figure out what it wants to do. So be prepared for it to like be a little bit in between frames. Maybe you just set it to analyze and like, you know, go check something on your phone and then come back to it. Now there's a very good chance that it doesn't get very far without having a problem, but you can at least see how, at least the first time, kind of give it a chance, see how it operates. All right. And even on this one, I've got a bit of a jitter on it, which is annoying. All right. So you see all these keys? That's what I mean by you can't change something afterwards. All right, and if I zoom in, you can see the trail of keyframes. Um, 
I can scroll through and kind of watch um, page up and page down are f a way of framing. Now here's the weird thing when you, I scrub through it looks like the sphere is jittering within the box meaning something is not lining up right but if I frame through it looks perfect. What's happening is when you scrub it's moving the tracker at a different speed like it, it's moving the tracker and then it's thinking to change what the frame looks like so this is not a good guide if, if it's working and frankly watching it is not a good guide if, if it's working you have to frame through it and you can even see as I'm framing like there's a lag between when the outline moves and when this moves so just be aware of that all right um, also Let's say I get halfway through and then I realize this is like making a mess of everything. And so I stop it, right? This would be a stop button. You just press stop or you click somewhere and it stops. And I need to go back a few frames and check. Do not use these buttons to go back and check the work. This work will stay if you scrub through or use page up and page down. If you use these, you will be reanalyzing and changing your results. Which means if this got all messed up and like flew off, I'm gonna like, nope, 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 that's not what I'm trying to move. And there we go. So if that got all messed up like this and you go, oh my gosh, what happened? And you start to step backwards using this, you're just gonna re mess up everything, um, going backwards even further. So what you need to do is use page up and page down, right? Use this to just simply look through everything and you can see the mess up is still there you know but you're not further messing up everything and everything before it is fine so these things are permanent until you reanalyze um, so I can go back to that one actually I can just undo and get rid of it there we go um, but you really want to make sure that you're paying attention to the difference between these which will reanalyze and change the marker and this interface which is just looking through what you already have. It is very common to get halfway through something, stop, page up to go backwards and see like hey how did that go and then page back down. Another thing that's very common is to attach something and see how it looks and then like maybe retrack it. Alright so how do we well we need something to track it to so I'm just gonna import something from somewhere um, I think I have a couple of random useless images. I have a, here we go, an image of, uh, it's a drawer full of, full of doorknobs. Alright, so I'm going to bring this into the composition. Now if you were still on this layer you wouldn't see it because it's, it's only this layer that you see. And I'm going to shrink this way down because I don't need it to be that large. All right, and I go back to my layer tracker, this tab right here, and uh, make sure you click back on the layer that was being tracked. You'll notice that if this is clicked, like a lot of that stuff had vanished, and you're like, oh my god, where are my you know options? Click on the layer that was being tracked. Go to edit target. This is where you choose what gets attached to the tracker. So if you're, again, using the laser swords example or any other effects, if you're changing the picture on a shield or whatever, you might have a layer solid that has effects on it, right? You link to that layer through here. Now, because I only have two layers, it knows what to do because, you know. You can also, by the way, link to an effect point control. So if you have... Um, I don't know, like a, a, please don't have a lens flare, but if that, that has a center on it, that has a point on it, a lot of effects do, you can track those to something as well. So you could give a lens flare halo to someone's head if you really wanted to. Please don't do that. Um, so I hit OK, and that just tells it what the target is, and then I can hit Apply. And it asks you, apply to you know dimensions X and Y, or only X or only Y. I've literally never had a reason to only use X or Y. I'm sure there's a reason that option is there, but obviously I want both to apply. So I hit OK, and I go back out here, and now, 
right? That image is following that tracker. Again, this is a good example in terms of it's really easy to track that dot. It's a terrible example in terms of you would never do this. Um, obviously, you could just copy and paste position keyframes from one thing to the other. Um, and there is something kind of oddly deliberate about that animation as opposed to this. Like this feels a little bit smoother. Why? Because there's only two keyframes with Bezier curves. So it is perfectly uniform. Even with our perfect tracking, this looks a little weird. I mean, it's also weird to have an image floating around like that, but it looks a little weird um, because it's not going to be perfect, perfect. And you'll know that. Um, now, if you wanted to smooth something out, there are, um, where is it somewhere? Uh, the smoother. So there are ways to smooth out keyframe things. Um, so you would select all the keyframes and, oh, let me see. There it is. Um, you would select uh, this and I could, oh wait, no, I'm on the wrong thing. Um, there we go. When you attach it, it uh, changes the position keyframe. So I could select the position keyframes and apply a smoother to it. And you see it does this. That might look better. That looks a little better. Um, but that only works on something like this, where maybe you have a halo vaguely floating over someone's head. If you're doing motion tracking to apply, say, an image to the front of a shield or like those Harry Potter posters, those need to be precise. Smoothing it out really is not too much of an option, especially not this much, because it could deviate, right? This was a perfect sign path that I animated for this sphere. So it's easy to smooth out the animation on the thing tracked to it and have it match. That's not the case. If you have a handheld camera and you're tracking something, you know, live, all right? So that's part one of the motion tracking um, lab. Part two will have to wait because I have to get the assets from the school. Um, but it's four corner tracking and it uses actual footage and it's not perfect. It's not easy. Um, so just beware. If you want to shoot something with trackers, make sure you are outside in very good light um, and that your trackers are very, very boldly colored compared to the thing you are tracking. If you have a white piece of paper, you should have really, really dark saturated trackers on it, uh, like black masking tape or something. Um, or, you know, because even I had dark blue paper on mine and it was, it didn't turn out well because it couldn't see, like the white, the light from outside washed it out. Um, but if you don't have enough light, you, the pic, your film will get grainy and then you can't see anything anyways. All right. So if any of you who missed this want to use motion trackers, um, let me know and we can make sure you get set up properly.